Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social television magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi, and I'm presenting this week's program with my wonderful co-host, Fariwars Puya. Hello. In this week's program, we're going to be discussing the issue of whether gay rights and, gay, and right, equal rights for gay people is possible in places like Iran, the Middle East and North Africa. We've got a wonderful interview with Terry Sanderson, who's the president of the National Secular Society and the author of nine books on gay rights issues. It's a wonderful interview, you're gonna love it. And we also, of course, have the usual shocking news of the week as well as the insane fatwa of the week. Before we go into our program though, let's listen to a short background clip on this week's issue. Stay with us. The gay rights movement in Britain and Europe is a clear example of immense changes secured in a short time period as a result of social revolution. Gay people have managed to secure all the legal rights available to citizens in Europe. However, gay people continue to face discrimination in many countries and even the death penalty under Sharia law in places like Iran. I suppose the question of this week's program is whether rights can be secured, equal rights, as it is in Europe for gay people in a place like Iran, in the Middle East and North Africa. In my opinion, it's impossible under an Islamic regime, under any form of theocracy. And in places where we've seen the secure, securing of equal rights, whether it's rights for gay people, for women, for minorities, for atheists, for free thinkers, dissenters, and so on and so forth, it has often been directly and intrinsically linked with the secularization of society. I don't know if you no, I, um, agree, I, I agree the complete establishment of the rights like um, um, other civil rights in countries like Iran and North Africa uh, it requires a precondition that the uh, religious state uh, doesn't exist, uh, you're right. But that doesn't stop people uh, sort of forming the fundamentals and the bases within society. And we, we, we could see that that's already started. There's a nascent sort of gay right movement in Iran, in Middle East, in North Africa. And they've actually started to openly start debate in uh, the, the, the many sort of gay rights move, uh, groups in Iran already both underground and abroad, and I think it's quite widespread. And recognition of this movement by other political forces in society, I think that's gaining grounds, and that's a welcome sign that society in places like Iran are recognizing that this is part and parcel of the uh, uh, civil rights, and you can't have a society uh, which claims to be democratic, uh, recognizes people's rights without recognizing rights of the gay people. I mean, it's true in a sense that you don't, you know, even under the worst situations like an Islamic regime in Iran, there are so many people pushing boundaries all the time. We see that with the women's rights movement, women unveiling, even though it is illegal to do so. And we're also seeing that with the gay rights movement in a sense. We've got, you know, this huge underground um, gay um, scene in Iran and uh, lots of people having gay sex, even though, uh, if you recall, in uh, 2007, was it, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who was the president then, had said that we don't have homosexuals in Iran. And there's a really interesting research that was recently done uh, in the parliament by the parliaments, the Majlis's research department, where they interviewed, it was um, 142,000 young adults and secondary school students. And they found that 80% of the unmarried females were actually having sex with the opposite sex. And 17% of those students and young adults considered themselves homosexuals. So, Clearly, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is wrong. There are tons of homosexuals in Iran and people who are living and loving despite all the rules and regulations there. No, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, that's, that's as wide as, uh, widespread as there is everywhere else. Um, and, you know, Islamic Republic can just deny it in the face of reality. But that doesn't take the issue away. What's happened in places like Iran, the harsh uh, religious uh, states and autocratic uh, states, has actually shown the rest of the society that oppressing uh, gay uh, rights, the rights of gay people in those countries, uh, it's uh, is part and parcel of maintaining 
the rule of uh, religious uh, a government which um, sees its own right to interfere in people's sexual behavior and sexual rights and private affairs. And people more and more recognize that uh, gay people are oppressed and, uh, and they see them next to other uh, sort of rights movement like women's rights movement and part and parcel of this broader movement and opposition in Iran and Middle East. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wonder what you think about this. I mean, it's interesting because oftentimes in situations where people are forced to um, deny their sexuality, they are, you know, persecuted because of it. In Iran, for example, you can have flogging as well as the death penalty if you are found to have gay sex. Irrespective, there's a backlash oftentimes, and you find that people are having more sex, as you can see with the statistics in Iran, and you hear a lot of young people saying that, the sort of having sex is a way of resistance and dissent in an extent because, you know, a lot of things that aren't allowed in society in Iran are done in the bedroom and in the privacy of people's home. And obviously sex is one of them. Um, we now, let, let's go together and listen to this wonderful interview we did with Terry Sanderson. Uh, there's a lot of really important information on you know, the one, the importance of secularism for gay rights, but more importantly, how one can be a happy homosexual. He's written a book on it. And also, how to treat your gay child, how to treat yourself as someone who's, who's gay, how to love yourself and to um, recognize, um, you know, the reality of who you are. Let's listen to this interview. Don't go away. Hello, Terry Sanderson. Welcome to our program. Hello. It's a great pleasure to have you, and especially uh, with the wonderful work you do with the National Secular Society, an organization which I personally am in love with, particularly given the fact that it's well known for being a bulldog and very often aggressive. What's your point of view on, on people who say that? Well, we're not aggressive. Um, we, we are very rational. I mean, aggressive seems to suggest that you're, you're out of control, but all our campaigns are actually very carefully thought through. And we are a bit militant, mil more militant than some other secularist groups, but that is, I think is necessary sometimes in order to make people listen to you because secularism is an issue that religious organizations and religious leaders would love you not to talk about. They would love you not to think about taking their privileges away. So uh, occasionally you do have to shout and that gets us a reputation of being aggressive. But when we do shout, it's, we're shouting common sense and uh, we're not shouting for the sake of it. I mean, definitely. What do you think of people who very often equate, let's say, militant secularism with religious extremism? Well, it's ridiculous, but I understand their motivation for doing it. They, they misunderstand what secularism really is. And secularism is not about taking their religion away from them. It's not about uh, doing down their churches or their mosques or their temples. It's nothing to do with that. It's about giving everybody the opportunity to believe whatever they want to and not believe if they don't want to. And that is a very rare commodity in many parts of the world. Um, we, in America, you, you have a secular constitution. So in, in effect, all Americans are secularists. Um, and they haven't had the religious wars that Europe has had and that the Middle East is having now because they're protected from one religion taking over the government. And I think that that is brilliant. It was a, a stroke of genius when the founding fathers came up with that idea. Um, so I, I always say, you know, it worked for America. It can work for other places too. And that's what we would like to see. In a sense, um, you know, it, you talk about the fact that it is necessary also to protect particularly minorities, women, and, and free thinkers in any given society. And, uh, you know, uh, what, what's interesting is that you came to secularism from your gay rights activism perspective. I, I've seen that you've read, I'm sorry, you've written more than nine books on this issue, which is amazing. What's the link? Why do you think there is a link, isn't there? There is. It's because I think that nowadays in, in Europe, um, the, the only real opponents of gay rights are religions. 
Um, so we have to give focus to that and why they have the power to interfere with people's private lives, why they want to control people's private lives, not just gay people's, but women, anybody who, who does something that they think they shouldn't be doing and they want to control us. Um, and I don't think that the church has any right to be in our bedrooms. Uh, and I, that, that's why I'm a secularist, because that's just one aspect of secularism, but it's an important one, because church has just loved trying to control you. I mean, I, you've, one of the books you read, which I found very interesting, is the one that's titled The Happy Homosexual. How to be a happy how homosexual. To, how to be yeah, a happy yeah. homosexual, exactly. And in it, you have some interesting advice and information for people. And obviously, a lot of our viewers are going to be in Iran, but I'd like you to go through some of them. One was the issue of not being invisible, how that really helps someone. Yeah, I wrote that book originally at the very beginning of the gay rights movement back in the early 70s, when it was very difficult for people to be honest about who they were. Homosexuality had only just been decriminalized in Britain. So um, people were still very wary about being open about it, but a movement formed about young people who were fed up with having to hide, fed up with being denied the right to be who they were and to love how they wanted to love. And, and this movement grew and became so effective. It was just, I mean, what has happened in the, in the 30, 40 years since that movement first uh, emerged is that we, we've won everything. In Britain, we have everything that everybody else has. Gays are now completely legally recognized. There are still some people who don't like the idea, still some people who are homophobic. We'll never get rid of that. Uh, there are people who've got prejudices about all kinds of things. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, bothered, really, that there are some people who don't like gay people. Um, but I do think that it's important for the mental health of gay people that they are able to live their lives uh, fully. And if that means having a partner of the same sex, I think they should be entitled to do that. Fortunately, we've won that argument and now gay marriage is available, not only here, but all across Europe and um, in, a, in some states of America too. So um, we have this wonderful uh, progress that's been made over those 40 years quite incredible. When I started out in the gay rights movement in the 1970s, I would have put a bet on, I put my life savings on a bet that we would not achieve gay marriage in my lifetime. And look how it's, it hasn't been that long when you think about it, isn't it? it for, for such a social revolution, yeah, it's been yeah. achieved in a very short time. Um, but there we are, it's because it was just, and the churches and the mosques resisted every step of the way. They tried to, to, to defeat every uh, legal reform that was brought to Parliament. Um, they failed ultimately. They succeeded on occasions. You know, they won battles, but ultimately we won the war. And I think that uh, is an, uh, an example that secularists can now take to heart. Social change is, is possible. Yeah. I mean, it, it's inter there's a million questions that are coming to mind right now. If I can just focus on this issue for a second, I mean, what sorts of things do you think could translate in countries like the Middle East and North Africa where, you know, homosexuality is considered a crime, it's punishable by death in some instances? I, I know they're, they're, they're not obviously very similar situations, but I'm sure there are some lessons that can be learned and taught. Yeah, there are. And it, it, unfortunately, there's no easy way around it. Somebody's got to be brave and take the first steps. And I know that they are beginning to do that in Iran, um, that, you, that you have a nascent gay movement beginning to emerge. But it's very difficult because it's a different culture. It's a culture dominated by religion, a disapproving religion, a, a lethal religion for some gay people. Uh, so, you know, taking those first steps from the closet is a very different prospect in Iran than it would be in Britain. When, it, when I did it for the first time in 1969, it was relatively easy. But somebody to do that in Iran for the first time uh, it is dangerous. I mean, one of the things I wonder, there's so many parallels. We often, with people coming out as atheists, for example, and ex-Muslims, we often sh talk about parallels with the gay rights movement, coming out of the closet. 
And don't you, do you think that maybe social media is going to have a positive impact on helping people come out as gay? It can do, um, but ultimately it's a personal thing. You cannot do it electronically. You know, you can, you can make the announcement that you're homosexual, but in the end, it's your mum and dad who matter. It's your brothers and sisters, your friends, your work colleagues. They're the ones who have to accept and to make you a whole person who's free. And um, I think you can't do that by social media. You could send them an email, and I know some people have done that, or write a letter, but it's not the same as sitting down with mum and dad and telling them and having it out and getting through the difficulties and the bad reactions, because you can, and you do, and it happens all the time. Just yesterday, I noticed on YouTube, there was a, a, a video of a young man who'd set up a camera in his bedroom, then invited his mum in and said, Mum, I'm gay. Um, Mum had said, I love you still, you know, and nothing will stop me loving you. She said, by the way, I've got something to tell you. I've got a girlfriend. So, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things can happen on this journey. Sometimes it's difficult and hard. Sometimes it's very easy. You don't know till you do it. But the reward is that you have a full, honest, open life that you can live with your partner. And I think that is so important because you... I've seen so many people go through lives denying and, and refusing to come out of the closet, living a, a lonely old age where they've never experienced the, the, the wonderful um, feelings that loving another person bring. So that should, they, nobody should deny themselves that. And even if you have to do it because of cultural circumstances, if you have to do it secretly and behind closed doors, try to do it because you'll be a better more whole, happier person. So although my book was called How to Be a Happy Homosexual, I think it would be more honest to say how not to be an unhappy homosexual. The way to be unhappy is to, uh, to keep on hiding and denying and refusing and saying, no, I'm not. That is the way to make yourself miserable. Um, you, you also in your book talk about uh, how parents can deal with gay children and I think that, that might be interesting and important for people who live mm. in Iran. Well in my book which I called um, uh, How to Cope If Your Child is Gay, the first thing I said on the front page was do not do anything precipitous. Don't kick your child out. Don't sort of abandon them and tell them to, to leave the house and never darken our doors again. Don't do anything like that. Wait. Give it some time to cool. Start to think. Start to investigate. Start to, 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 to question. But don't do anything precipitous that is going to end up with your family splitting apart. Sometimes never to be repaired. There was a wonderful film that was made in America about fundamentalist Christians who had gay children and how they reacted to it. Almost all of them had rejected their children. One woman had, had sort of said, you know, this is, I can't cope with this because my church says no. And she had told her daughter, you'll have to go. I don't want you in the house. Her daughter had gone away and written her a letter saying, you know, I'm really sorry that you've done this because I still love you and I will always love you and I'm, I'm here when you want me. And the mother had screwed this letter up and thrown it in the bin. But then she produced it, she'd unscrewed it, and she said, this is the letter. She said, my daughter hanged herself oh. almost as soon as she'd written this. She said, and I, I will never forgive myself for that. So don't do anything that is going to, to maybe provoke some tragic circumstance. Wait, you still love your kid. It may be not quite the kid you thought you had, but it, it's still, he's still there, or she's still there, and, and you can still love them, but you have to work through it, and sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes it's full of ignorance, misinformation, people telling you the wrong thing. Find out for yourself, and find out through your child, because you want to go on loving. You don't want to hate people. That's no way to live. You want to love your children, and you can love them, it doesn't have to be the end if they tell you they're gay. It, they, you can continue to have a good, loving relationship with them. I mean, at the end, we have to come to the 
understanding as we have on many other issues in the world that there is nothing wrong with being gay. I mean, what, what do you think about these attempts at converting gay people? And yeah, I mean, again, it's religion. Religion doesn't want gay people to exist, so it tries to make them not, not exist. It pretends that it can pray people out or counsel them out of, of their sexual orientation. It's ridiculous. They can't. They cannot do it. And it's failed over and over again. And in fact, some of the leaders of the ex-gay movement in America, where all this originated, um, have come, come out now and said, no, it doesn't work. And I want to apologize to all the people we've tortured over the years trying to persuade them out of their sexuality, making them feel even more guilty about it, making them miserable. It didn't work. It doesn't work. We've given up. Mm. And I think that's important. You, you mentioned something about loving yourself. We're, we're running out of time. I want to ask you one more question after that. So if you can just talk about that as well briefly, on yeah. how important uh, that is. I think self-hate is very easy for gay people. They, they don't like the idea that they're different, particularly when they're on their own, they're in the closet, they've got no support, nobody to tell them positive things. They hate themselves. And so this comes out in all kinds of strange ways. It, ca it comes out in maybe persecuting other gay people to try and deflect <laughs> a suspicion. And I think, um, you know, you, you, have to, you have to love yourself, but you have to love yourself as a gay person, if that's what you are. You know, sometimes it takes a long time to, to come to terms with it. But if you don't love yourself as a gay person, you will hate yourself. And I think it's, um, it's most important to work through that. Again, very difficult for some people very easy for others. Last question is, you know, you mentioned all the advances of the gay rights movement in Europe and the West in general. Do you think that movement has a responsibility to um, the gay rights, the, the, you know, the burgeoning, the nascent gay rights movement in Iran, the Middle East and North Africa? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that that is where attention is beginning to turn now. We've done our achievements. We've got what we wanted. There's nothing else we can campaign for in Europe really, um, except social acceptance, but that's something that's done on an individual basis. The focus is now turning to foreign uh, persecution of gay people, um, and there are, there are, there's a lot of campaigning being done in the EU, in the United Nations, and uh, in, in local gay groups who are trying desperately to support these uh, emerging gay movements in, in places where it is very difficult and very dangerous uh, to begin, make this make this move towards um, an organised movement. Uh, we hope we can support them, but we're up against huge odds that we're never there for the British gay movement. Um, but like you never know, maybe in our lifetimes. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much, Terry. <laughs> All right. Thanks. enjoyed that wonderful interview. I think there were so many amazing points that were raised by Terry. One of them that he mentioned was on the issue of culture and I do want to refer to that here because I do think that there's a huge dis dis discrepancy and distinction between the Iranian regime's culture which executes people and flogs them and even denies that homosexuality exists whilst having a penal code that sentences um, gays and lesbians to flogging and execution. On the other hand, you've got you know a, a large number, a very young population. Seventy percent of the population in Iran is under thirty. You've got a very young population and large numbers of people who are gay, who have gay sex, and are accepted for being gay. If if you you see some of the documentaries and interviews with gay people, you do see that there is this coming out as it is, and how social media has, has helped with this. No, absolutely, I think. One of the things about this interview is that it's so clear. I think Terry's interview is so warm 
uh, so loving in a way, and it's it's amazing. And I need to really congratulate Yosef and Terry. I think that that's a brilliant um, interview. Um, the striking thing for me for the interview was um, uh, when Terry is explaining uh, and advising parents who find uh, the children are gay and they have the conversation and say, look, do not abandon your children. Think about it. It's like you're wrapping around, uh, you know, a, a loving sort of creating a loving situation and allowing people to think uh, and, uh, and to be themselves and uh, to stop interference of religious or um, other sort of discriminatory ideas that exist in society. And I think that was a brilliant message, such a beautiful narrative, I think, is given to a very humane sort of uh, movement. I think uh, he, he also mentions an important point of the need for the gay rights movement that has made many gains in the West to defend and support the gay rights movement in Iran, in the Middle East, in North Africa, and in places where uh, gay people are still facing serious discrimination and persecution. Do tell us what you think about this question that we've raised in this program. We now have, of course, as usual, uh, the shocking news of the week. We've got three pieces of shocking news of the week. One is uh, news that ISIS uh, terrorists have uh, executed in public a women's rights campaigner and a lawyer, Samira Salih al Nuemi, merely for criticizing them on Facebook. She was abducted from her home and tortured for five days before she was publicly killed. You've got an Iranian court who has sentenced four workers from Razi Petrochemicals plants to six months imprisonment and 50 lashes, merely for defending workers' rights and strikes in that plant. They were found guilty of disturbing public order. And there's Iranian blogger Sohail Arabi, who's 30, who's now been sentenced to death in Iran for insulting Muhammad Islam's prophet on Facebook. I mean, can you see the difference between Daesh and Islamic regime? I can't see the difference. And just one point, uh, the lashing of the uh, workers who protest uh, to the working condition, it reminds me of the slave owners in uh, in America uh, before uh, before the Civil War, when uh, slaves were actually protesting in this condition, and they were publicly lashed. The Islamic regime code of uh, um, practice, the the judiciary is actually uh, based on a slavery, pure slavery, and that needs to stop. I think well, this is a call out to people who consider themselves progressive, who consider themselves on the left, of the need to defend, uh, you know, uh, the activists, the labor activists, as well as those who are speaking out against Islamism. Sharia law is nothing but madness, and it should be recognized as such. Let's now go to the insane fatwa of the week. <laughs> In this week's fatwa of the week, we've got an Egyptian preacher and he's vice president of the Salafist call. His name is Yasser Borhami and he's issued a fatwa that's saying if your wife is being raped and you feel your life is in danger, if you have to go and defend her, let her get raped because it's nothing more than your pocket being mugged, basically because she's your property. And get this, the head of the Religious Endowments Ministry has said this is contrary to Sharia law uh, because in fact, she's his honor and he should even die to defend it. So even them considers her nothing more than just mere property. Absolutely, I think you said it. it's, you know, it's not, a, as far as the Sharia and Islamic uh, um, um, laws are concerned, women are secondary, if at all. I think that, that's the, you could see that sort of image of women in both uh, uh, sort of uh, people who've actually spoken about this, this, this case. And I think that that's a terrible thing. And that's, this, is, this reality, it's the life of millions of women in Middle East and North Africa. Yeah. It's shocking, seriously, very shocking, that women are considered so subhuman uh, that they're compared with a mugging of your pocket, in, in your, money in your pocket. We hope you've enjoyed this week's program. We had a lot to bring to you, and um, we hope 
uh, you know, you, you found the points that we raised interesting, please write to us and tell other people about our program as well, distribute it amongst your friends and colleagues. Until next week, we hope you have a wonderful time. See you then. Bye.